Good afternoon, everyone. I now call this meeting of the House Standing Committee on Appropriations and Revenue, meeting number seven, duly open for transaction of business. If you can, please, everyone, please silence your phones, or better yet, maybe put them on airplane mode. All right. At this time, will the clerk please call the roll? Representative Beckler. Here. Representative Bentley. Representative Blanton. Present. Representative Bridges. Here. Representative Dossett. Here. Representative Fisher. Here. Representative Fleming. Here. Representative Flood. Present in the office. Thank you. Representative Fugit. Here. Representative Gentry. Here in the room. Representative Hale. Here. Representative Hart. Here in the room. Representative Hatton. Here in the room. Representative McCool. Here. Representative Nemus. Here. Representative Palumbo. Here in my office. Thank you. Representative Prunty. Here in the room. Representative Raymond. Here. Representative Riley. Here. Representative Santoro. Here. Representative Tipton. Here. Representative Wilner. Here. Chair Reed. Here in the room. Chair Petrie. Present in the room. We have a quorum and duly acted to uh, proceed with business. Um, this afternoon, you see the agenda. We have uh, House Bill 8, House Bill 243, House Bill 244. At this time, we will proceed with House Bill 244. Representative Petrie at the table, please introduce yourself for the record. Jason Petrie, State Representative for House District 16. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. You may please proceed. We have a committee sub number two. There's a motion. And a second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. Committee sub number two is adopted. Sir, you may pr proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. Uh, we have... House Bill 244 with committee substitute, which um, addresses the judicial branch budget. The judicial branch budget is mainly a continuation budget from years past, especially prior year past. I will not go through every piece, at least on initial presentation, but bring you to certain highlights therein. Um, no particular order. There was in the original bill filed a $38 million general fund appropriation to provide for completion of the electronic filing system, otherwise known as CourtNet, uh, within the court system. The appropriation for the project remains in this committee subversion. Uh, the source funding has been changed from general fund to ARPA funds. The judicial branch. Um, has been so kind as to do research on the issue and have convinced uh, me and others that ARPA source funding is appropriate, so we have moved that. As far as construction, capital construction, uh, Leslie County was in prior uh, version and remains. Uh, there has been um, an addressing of Graves County, and as you know, uh, Graves County was hit by a tornado in December. And I think everyone on the committee is aware that the court uh, house was uh, decimated. So the judicial has recommended that we appropriate approximately $3 million for a temporary uh, facility, as well as close to a million dollars in addition to uh, there to uh, for record um, retention and rehabilitation so that those can be still utilized as well as I think it was an approximately an $18 million plus authorization for the Graves County Courthouse once we move to the temporary phase and once we move into, okay, what will the permanent project or permanent courthouse look like? So we have simply accounted for that in the capital construction. The only other things of, of note, really a difference in this bill is that we have addressed um, increment salary. Uh, and the easiest way to explain this, Mr. Chairman, is elected and unelected personnel within the judicial branch. So elected would include all judges, uh, Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, all trial co court judges such as family court, circuit court, district court, and 
circuit district clerks, circuit clerks that are elected. Those are the elected class. And then we have the unelected, which is all the staff and other employees in the judicial branch, including but not limited to staff for each of those judicial levels, as well as central office. I believe CDWs will be included, so it will include anyone and everyone else. All right. So of the unelected employees, uh, first we are proposing in this budget to increase their salary base by $2,000. And after, and as soon as that, I think that would take a, take effect on July one in the next cycle. Once the two thousand is assessed and added on, uh, then base plus the two thousand would receive a six percent increase on the total. And that's for uh, non-elected employees. For elected, which would include the judges I just referenced, as well as the clerks just referenced, uh, we have provided for uh, an increment increase that would take a place that would take effect on July one, and there would be a six percent increase on their existing salaries. Part of the reasoning for the two thousand dollar base increase for unelected staff is that. We are, as in all other branch context, we're dealing with how do we retain workers and how do we recruit workers, and we're missing positions, and we need to get those filled so that constituents are receiving the services that they need through the judicial branch, um, and also to help out or at least start to assist what may be a disparity between the executive branch scale and the judicial branch scale for those same employees. And with that, I would. Uh, I think I have concluded what I have to say on the judicial branch budget. Move passion. It has been properly moved and second that we uh, move forward with the motion of HB 244 as amended by committee sub number two. Is there any discussion? Representative Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate your presentation, Chairman Petrie. What is the uh, total appropriation that's going to be added to increase the salaries for our elected and non-elected? That's going to be a dollar figure I don't have in my head, to be honest with you. Do we have that dollar figure available? We do not have it. Okay, that. thank you. Representative Gentry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, how does this appropriation for salaries compare to what the uh, Court of Justice requested? It was this meeting, right? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> it was this session, yes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, I won't get it exactly correct, and I've been in talks with um, um, with the AOC and the chief about this, and I'm not going to uh, even attempt to tell you well, this is what they want. Uh, I think what they were looking for was a simple dollar figure increase, a bump in the base, uh, and approach it that way. We decided to do it with a base increase as well as a 6%, and and just so we all know, understand that this is passing out of a committee in the House. Uh, and then whatever we stake ground on, and then we'll deal with that in the Senate also. Okay, just a quick follow-up, if I could. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, as, as it stands right now in the sub, are, are we appropriating less than what they requested? Um, I'm going to assume so because I think that their I think that their request was either 7,500 or 10,000 increase in just base without a percentage with that. So if you look at 2,000, if somebody's making $50,000, 52 or 48 and two gets you to 50 and 50 with a six percent increase, that's not going to equate to everything. So sometimes. Um, uh, if the case is made strong enough, you can get close to what you ask. If there's some holes in it, you get a little further away. Okay, thank you. Yep. Representative Wellner. I actually had this exact same question as Rep. Gentry. So. Okay. All right, seeing no further questions, we should now proceed, proceed to vote. Clerk, please call the roll. Representative Beckler. Yes, ma'am. Representative Bentley. Yes, ma'am. Representative Blanton. Aye. Representative Bridges. Yes. Representative Dossett. Yes. Representative Fisher. May I explain my pass vote, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. While I wholeheartedly support the entire judicial budget, including the raises for clerks and staff, I will cast a pass vote at this time 
lest it be perceived that I may have a personal interest in salary raises for the judiciary. Thank you. Representative Fleming. Yeah, aye. Representative Flood. Yes. Representative Fugate. Yes. Representative Gentry. Briefly explain my vote. Uh, uh, I'm going to vote yes today, but uh, I will encourage my colleagues to help see that the uh, uh, Chief Justice gets what he requests for us. Thank you. Representative Hale. Yes. Representative Hart. Yes. Representative Hatton. Explain my vote, please. Yes. Um, I am going to pass at this time because I still have hope that we could um, maybe get a floor amendment on that would do the full increase that is so very richly deserved, especially by our non-elected staff. Um, I'm watching my circuit clerk staff get paid less than the county clerk staff and um, all other clerk staff in, in the courthouse, so I will pass. Representative McCool. Yes. Representative Nemes. Briefly explain, if I might. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been involved in judicial budgets in some way or some capacity since 2004. One is the requester, and I want to note that uh, in every single budget, the request has been made was more than was funded, and so that's not anything unusual. Um, this budget, while obviously all of us want more raises for all of our employees, certainly non-electeds, we've done more for non-electeds in the Court of Justice than other areas, um, and certainly more for the circuit clerks. We wish we had some more for there. We all do, I think. And we're going to work toward that. I do want to note the most important thing. This is my highlight. And that is our judges have been falling further and further behind in their pay in the last 12 years or so. This is a significant step forward for our judges in getting them where we believe that they should be um, compared to lawyers in the state, but also compared to other judges throughout the country. So this is a big step for them. Got work to do on some other things in this, all budgets as we always do. But great step forward for judges so I want to thank you for bringing this thank you mr. chairman yes representative Plumbo yes representative Prunty yes representative Raymond pass representative Reed yes representative Riley yes representative Santoro Representative Tipton. Yes. Representative Wilner. I'd like to briefly explain my vote, if I could. Yes, ma'am. We heard such a compelling presentation from Chief Justice Minter, Minton, excuse me, and um, how really dire uh, the situation is with staffing and with uh, judges being underpaid to the extent where the quality of the judiciary is really at risk. And while I agree with Representative Nemes and others who said that this is a significant step forward, I don't feel that it's enough. Um, and I feel like we're at a, an unusual time right now where we could afford to do more. And so I'm going to cast a no vote today. Thank you. Representative Petrie. Yes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have 20 yes votes, one no vote, three pass. House Bill 244, as amended by co committee sub number two, passes favorably. Same shit on the House floor. At this time, Representative Petrie, you're still sworn in. Will you please proceed with House Bill 243? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 243, as filed, is the legislative branch budget bill uh, proposed. Um, largely, it is a, and, and everyone should take great comfort in the fact that it is only seven pages, uh, as opposed to everything else we're dealing with. So um, of those seven pages, it is largely a continuation budget, continuation of current services and base operating expenses. Uh, there are some operating expenses that increased. As we all know, there's been additional space uh, that we are occupying and using, as well as the charge uh, per square footage has increased also. So we have accounted for that increased rent for additional space in the capital annex. Uh, we do have, as we've discussed in the prior budget, a salary increment of 6% for staff and legislators. And what we have done, um, and, and this is always a charged issue it seems, uh, 
Uh, we simply took language from 2008 and moved that into current. And the reason we took 2008 language is that is the last time that this issue uh, was addressed on the legislative legislator side. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are really no other major changes in that bill. It is largely a continuation budget. Motion. It has been properly moved and seconded for the passage of House Bill 243. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we should now proceed to, proceed to vote. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Representative Beckler. Yes, ma'am. Representative Bentley. Representative Blanton. Aye. Representative Bridges. Representative Dossett. Yes. Representative Fisher. Yes. Representative Fleming. Aye. Representative Flood. No. Representative Fugit. Yes. Representative Gentry. No. Representative Hale. Yes. Representative Hart. Yes. Representative Hatton. Explain my vote, please. Um, while I'm happy to see legislative raises for the staff of the legislative branch, I can't in good conscience vote yes to increase my, my own salary without any mandated um, pay increase for teachers in this state, so I vote no. Representative McCool. Yes. Representative Nemus. Yes. Representative Plumbo. No. Representative Prunty. Yes. Representative Raymond. Yes. Representative Reed. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Santoro. Yes. Representative Tipton. Mr. Chair, may I briefly explain my vote? Yes, sir. <clears throat> While I understand that uh, there are maybe members of the General Assembly that have some concerns about the legislative provision in here, we have such great staff at the LRC. And they do a wonderful job for us. They, they, they help. Our, 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 we, our position would be, our job would be impossible to perform without them. And I cannot, in good, in good conscience, vote against a raise for a dedicated LRC staff. Thank you. I vote yes. Representative Wilner. Briefly explain. Yes, ma'am. Um, like Representative Tipton, I am 100% behind a raise for legislative staff. But I'm voting no because I would prefer that our legislative raise that we're about to give ourselves, I would prefer that that be uh, dedicated to staff as well. Thank you. Chair Petrie. Uh, yes, I explain my vote. Yes, sir. I uh, just want to clarify one thing. Um, I remain a yes on the bill, uh, and we cannot give raises to ourselves, so it's a non-issue. It can only happen in the next cycle, which means uh, anyone better not be too presumptive about whether you re-elect yourself or not. Uh, so uh, no raises to ourselves, but we're looking at the next legislative cycle. Thank you. That is a yes. Yes, sir. With 19 yes votes, five no votes, zero pass votes, HB 243 passes favorably. Same shit on the House floor. We are now moving on to House Bill 8. Representative Petrie, you are already sworn in. Representative Fleming, will you please raise your right hand? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. All right. Representative Petrie, you may proceed at this moment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. And uh, I think this is the last one on our docket for this evening. Uh, the bill is a little lengthier and the issue is more complicated. Uh, House Bill 8 has been out for about a week. Uh, it is a topic that has been discussed uh, for over 100 years, and it has, is a topic that I've been discussing with many over the last year, two, three, four. Um, and there are essentially two main divisions in my mind, but some others may break it down uh, into further divisions. There is an individual income tax uh, provision, and that is... If we may, if uh, do I have a motion to... Second. Thank you. 
Are we uh, on? We're on PHS three at this. Yes. So the motion is to adopt committee substitute number three. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, like sign. Motion passes. Representative Patriot now, committee sub number three is before you. Thank you. All right, so House Bill 8, as amended by committee sub three. Again, back to two big um, divisions for me, two different categories. One is an individual income tax component, and then we have sales tax and other stuff. All right. On the individual income tax, um, I think this section, with the, uh, with the exception of uh, changing trigger numbers uh, is almost identical or identical to what has been uh, in, in the original bill. And simply the structural setup is this. Uh, based on what we have budgeted in House Bill 1, having met our appropriation needs uh, and with revenues as they have been received and projected, uh, we have approximately $1.1 $1 .1 in unappropriated funds as proposed by House Bill 1, Committee Sub 1, that's been passed over to the Senate. Springboarding off of that, as we've mentioned on the floor, reference to that bill, we springboard into a 5% to a 4% reduction of personal income tax. And that section, that part of the structure, really stands on its loan and alone in relation to the appropriation levels we have and the revenue levels we have without anticipating great increases of revenue or anything else uh, off to the side. The second part of the individual income tax is a trigger section. So if you look at four, once we go down to four and a hard, four and a hard reset, uh, then how do you get from four to zero, which is the goal on personal income tax? Um, there is no hard down. There is no forced down from four to zero. It is based on if revenues are sufficient to meet triggers predetermined, then we can go down to either a half a point or a full point in a given year until we reach zero, no more than a point in a year. And once ratcheted down, the rate does not float back up. And that is essentially section one of what's before us. And I would indicate, just make sure we're all clear, I've only talked about personal income tax. And as we've, I've stated before, there is no addressing of corporate income tax or LLET taxes or anything else out there. So we are only addressing personal income tax and that is it. And to reduce that rate ultimately from five percent to zero, five to four beginning January 1, 2023, and then from four to zero over time as revenues permit. Second big section to the bill, and I'm not trying to go to a particular page, but the second big section conceptually is the sales and use tax. And you will see that in section two of the bill, starting on page six, I believe there are definitions for tax services and in particular new services. Those definitions extend into section three, which really says these are the actionable parts of the sales and use tax that we are uh, modifying. And I believe that might be on about page 29 of the committee sub. And those will start, and I'm not going to read them all off, or I'm going to try to refrain from doing so, but there are a list of things. Uh, photography, marketing, unsolicited telemarketing, public opinion, research polling services, lobbying, executive <coughs> employee recruitment, websites, facsimiles, private mail rooms, bodyguards, um, monitoring, uh, security system monitoring services, private investigation, now here I go reading all of them, process server services, uh, and uh, some others that go into leisure type things. We have attempted to stay away from anything that, uh, that at least I've determined to be something that is an essential to the uh, living of a person that tries to get over to entertainment issues and things that um, um, are not going to affect people as much where they live on an ordinary daily basis. I will note that despite all of a lot of fire burning prior to uh, this bill being filed, uh, the structure of coming from five to zero it does not include, does not, does not include any tax upon groceries, 
It doesn't include up any taxes on medical, and it doesn't put anything on your primary house residential electric. So I've heard a lot from different groups about you have to do these things. In fact, we did not do those things. Those things continue on and all other things that aren't taxed other than listed here, we're really not affecting. There are some new ones that I think people may, be, need, may need to be aware of. We have some new industries, um, one in particular, car and ride sharing services. Peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, you hear those type things. There's a lot of anacronyms thrown around. Uh, there is simply across all transport of persons, a 6% tax put upon the service itself. So whether that be peer-to-peer, -peer, TNC, share ride-sharing, ride or uh, rentals or uh, car rentals, limousine services, all of those things are being hit, being put with a 6% tax. Without exception, a shred across the board. You will see a section, I wanna make sure I clarify this, Mr. Chairman, because I'm afraid uh, it may get uh, misunderstood. <clears throat> there is a transient room tax some people call Airbnb tax, those type things. There is no new tax being proposed in this bill on those type services. What we are doing in this bill is making sure that local taxes to be collected already, we're making clear, do that. As we found out, the big services seem to have contractual relationships with larger local governments and they pay pretty regularly but with smaller counties and cities, that may not be the case. And we're trying to make sure that the tax that's already imposed is actually being paid and we're being clear about that. But there is no bottom line increase to the state with this provision because there is no new tax on the state side. Throughout the remainder of the bill, essentially you'll see things that are sometimes non-codified language, some things are not public-private partnership, a statutory change to make sure certain things don't expire. Uh, there is one of interest that the Department of Revenue asked for that we included that said that the DOR should cease and not be allowed to collect past due medical bills on behalf of UK. Uh, that was seem to be a singular issue and I'm not sure how that got started. There is uh, an electric powered vehicle issue so we've all talked about, and I believe uh, Representative Santoro probably has talked about this more than anybody else. Um, we have a great increased use, and maybe in the future even more, of electric vehicles and hybrids. And so we have tried to define what that is and make sure that there are two ways that the state is approaching those vehicles as far as taxation. The first and easiest somewhat to wrap, um, wrap around is this, just like an automobile goes to a pump and there is a tax upon the gasoline and that tax is used to maintain roads and other things for road support. We've attempted to get an equivalent tax upon the kilowatt charging that passes through a four pay station. Also, a second type of tax, not on the same activity, that's upon the charging. Then we're trying to get an equivalency on when a car is brought into Kentucky or purchased and each year we all pay usage taxes. We have what's called in here a battery reclamation. I call it a mitigation fee. As we all know, electric vehicles and hybrids, electrics in particular, have several batteries in them. And I think we've all heard about tire disposal issues with combustible engines uh, in the near future. I don't know how near, but I think we're gonna have some issues with what do we do with the batteries? Just like we talk about what do we do with the batteries in our laptops and our cell phones. So we see this coming and other people have written about it. Um, and so upon the registration, there would also be a, a tax imposed for battery reclamation to the amount of 140 on an electric vehicle and $70 on hybrids because they don't have as many uh, batteries in them. We've also in the sub dealt with electric motorcycles separately because they use the roads in a different way and their batteries are different. So we put them at 70 with the hybrids rather than 140 with a full on uh, EV uh, automobile that we all would normally think about. The, well, oh, that's enough on that if someone's got questions. 
Most of the rest of the sections that follow thereafter are going to be um, renewal of non-codified language as you change things in the tax, tax structure. We have to make sure that all the other provisions that apply, we renew those and say, yes, they apply here also, but no changes on those things. Mr. Chairman, I think that's the main part of the bill. There is one other section, the committee sub, and, and first off, uh, you will, I forgot what the bill number is and I apologize, but you, if you look, Representative Plessy uh, was working on a parallel track to myself and others on the EV charging and the EV uh, battery reclamation. And so I give a lot of credit to him for the language in this bill relative to that. Unfortunately, he's not here, but I would love for him to have gone through that. Uh, I want to give him full credit for that. I asked him if I could co-opt his language, and he said yes. So I did in large part and modified it and made it my own a little bit, but it's largely his, and I, and I think it's a good idea, and it's a good structure to it. Now, along with that, I also co-opted a little more language. Um, uh, Representative Fleming and myself have worked on uh, tax modernization uh, ever since 17. And, and there is a particular piece that I asked him to continue to work on, um, and then we have co-opted that language with his uh, uh, graciousness, and let me put it in there with a slight change. And, and Mr. Chairman, if I would, if you will, I'd like for him to explain the portion regarding tax amnesty, please. Yes, sir, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate uh, Chairman Petrie uh, for um, this partnership and making sure we have a significant shift uh, in our tax structure so we can grow um, population and help uh, create as much wealth for those uh, low-income folks in order to go forward. What the chairman mentioned is a tax amnesty. And basically, it's, uh, it's used by city and states uh, throughout the decades as a tool to catch up on tax delinquencies. Consideration is made to alleviate the uh, interests and penalties in order to encourage the payment of past due liabilities. Typically, government entities offer this program every decade like Kentucky did in 2012. And at that time, the DOR collected about 58 million, actually around 58.4 million, which is slightly uh, higher than their goal, around 54 million. Currently, we have $250 million in outstanding, but I suspect it's higher uh, due um, because of the uh, collection efforts were relaxed during the COVID. This program is to, is to apply to state taxes, and if a taxpayer who participated in this program and fails to uh, file future returns, they will be subject to penalties, interest, and cost of collection. Those who are under an audit are still eligible but if they receive notice for any type of criminal investigation, they are not. And just as a ref point of reference to other states that have gone through this process, take Indiana. Indiana had a goal of 65 million, and they collected 255 million. Louisiana collected around um, 466 million, and they had a goal of 150 million. That's what it is in a nutshell. Um, and I think it's a, it's a good it's a it's a good program. Um, we did put some information there in terms of how we're going to procure it, uh, and I explained to this committee uh, a couple of days ago. I can't remember when, but a couple of days ago, everything's blurring together. Um, is that uh, we we we're, we are sensitive to um, to the Department of Resources and their and their workforce, uh, and so there we put a provision to give them the uh, an opportunity to procure this with the private sector, but obviously they will oversee this and manage this, um, just like a project manager makes their everything is is up to snuff. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that sort of concludes the tax MC description. Mr. Chairman, I, Mr. Chairman, I believe that concludes the main presentation on the bill. Thank you, sir. Before we move forward, I just want to personally thank you for this epic day in Commonwealth of Kentucky with HB8. I know all the hours and time and thought process and that you have put into this tax modernization package that moves Kentucky Commonwealth forward. So thank you very much. Well, Mr. Chairman, if, if I may interrupt just for a moment. No, I don't think I'm going to let you interrupt. Well, if you want, I won't. <laughs> go, ahead. go ahead. I just always want to say that to you. <laughs> it's your call, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Um, thank you, and um, I don't want to belabor this, but understand that uh, Chairman Reed has been involved in every, just like budget, has been involved in every single meeting, every single discussion, text, email, and, and on and on and on. And Jennifer Hayes, sitting up to his left, has, uh, has assisted us in great ways you could not imagine, trying to educate us on things that are extraordinarily complicated. And, uh, and, and Frank Willie over here, y'all know how he is on the budget. Uh, he has uh, been extraordinarily instrumental 
and Jacob Estes has been also. Uh, he's right there in the middle of everything and had some good suggestions and caught a couple of things in the bill at the last minute, got them fixed. Uh, so I appreciate all the work on that. It doesn't matter where you, where you fall on the bill. Uh, I believe this is a monumental shift, change of the barge. It doesn't change overnight, but it changes the barge a little and I believe it makes it in a healthier puts it in a healthier direction. I appreciate all of y'all's work on this. It couldn't have done it without you, and I mean that in all sincerity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes sir. Representative Hatton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is there a fiscal note available? And, and Representative Hatton, I apologize. When I sat down, I saw your text, and I apologize for that. I think you maybe hit me 30 minutes or so beforehand. There is a fiscal note, and I'll be glad to share my copy with you. Uh, it's going to be of limited value. In some senses, it's helpful on the explanation side to go through things. It is geared toward the original bill, not the sub, so that's a little off. Um, and then the other thing is, is that the numbers that they're using uh, do not account for the increase in revenue that would be coming in, as well as they account fully for all the expenses that are passing or appropriations that are passing through the House side. So whatever was in the budget plus anything else that's been going through, they add those on as expenses. Uh, with a reduction of revenue and an increase of the expense, it's going to show a negative on paper. Um, but I can't trust that at this point because other, we would be looking at House Bill 1 rather than any other expenditures or appropriations that might be going out. Plus, we could take account of what's going to happen as far as a um, uh, what should be a pretty significant carryover from this current fiscal year. Uh, those things aren't accounted for. Now, I will uh, just to make sure everyone's clear about this. Uh, there's no set of circumstances under which I'm going to try to push a bill through the General Assembly that will not balance out at the end of the day, uh, and that'll just have to be dealt with. But unfortunately, we don't have the budget back from the Senate. Those numbers are not set, uh, and appropriations sometimes work until the end of the session, as you know. But I have no intention, and I have every intention of not doing anything other than that. Yeah. Well, with, with all due respect, Mr. Chair, um, pursuant to Rule 52, I would move that we vote to request a fiscal note that's accurate and can let us know exactly what the fiscal impact of this bill will be and to delay further consideration of voting on this bill until we have a fiscal note. If I could explain Second. just real quickly, um, as far as having a fiscal note, yes. As far as the caveats I put to it, yes. Um, based on their numbers, it's as accurate as they're going to get because they're going to use the same method every time they rework it. And those deficiencies in the method will be there regardless of how many times they work the fiscal note. We have a motion in second. Yeah, in a second. We have a motion and a second on the motion. All those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. The motion fails. <laughs> Representative Raymond. Thank you. I have many genuine questions, and I've prioritized them because I'm not sure how many I can ask. Let's start going down the path, and okay, I'll, I'll stop wonderful. you and get close to the end. First off, sir, you're taxing summer camp. Uh I know you're going to get picked on for each little expansion of the sales tax. My big question is what the General Assembly really intends to do with the $1.2 billion in unappropriated funds. I realized today that I was mistaken in thinking that the Senate and the House were working together and, and had a one-two punch planned where we were doing a sort of rebate and then lowering the income tax rate. As I understand it now, the Senate's proposal of the rebate would wipe out the, the $1.2 billion surplus, and the lowering of the income tax that we're considering in the House would wipe out the $1.2 billion surplus. So would you clarify that for me and, and share with us what you can of conversations with the Senate and what you think the General Assembly, not what we ought to do, but what we're going to do with the $1.2 billion surplus? Um, one, my comments on the Senate plan is, are going to be limited because I've not had a lot of discussion about the sourcing and how they're funding uh, the full uh, imp fiscal impact of that bill. Uh, we have been working on this uh, a lot. Uh, theirs came out. It is simpler than ours and less pages than ours, but we still do not have data as far as how they're going to source it. I'm sure they have figured that out, but I'm not certain. 
Um, as far as is there a coordinated effort, um, I would love to tell you that there is, but I can't. I'm not going to lie to you about it. Okay, so there is no coordinated effort of a one-two punch. Uh, there is no conspiracy theory there. Unfortunately, there's no there there. I wish there were. Um, so they have their plan. We have our plan. Uh, a big difference between the two plans is simply this. Um, that is a rebate in a short amount of time to certain segments of the population. Uh, what we're proposing is a different way of approaching the taxation structure in Kentucky, and it is a much, much longer look than what they proposed. Now, you mentioned the 1.1 uh, unappropriated funds. Uh, without knowing their sourcing mechanisms, without confirming that, I can't tell you whether or not they're looking at the same money that we're looking at, and that's just a limit of my information. Thank you. May I ask another question? Yes, ma'am. We've been passing appropriation bills so far this session. Um, I think the, the most critical might be the $20 million something Read to Succeed Act. It was around $11 million, I believe, yes, but it wasn't an additional appropriation. That appropriation was an early literacy program referenced in House Bill 1, Committee Sub 1, and the, pro the bill that we passed through here was to clarify exactly where that money was supposed to go. You probably got the $20 million from when Representative Tipton testified about that bill. He said we already appropriated $10 million, and KDE had pledged to put in another 10 or $11 million on top of that, so that probably got you to the 20 Okay, so that bill, any others that that we've passed that have an appropriation, are those in conflict with the revenue loss that would result from this income tax reduction? In the method of way, the method by which the physical note is analyzed, uh, everything that has been passed through the House is added up as an expense, a deduction against income. Of course, those things we've passed to the House, none of those appropriations have come back from the Senate, and we've concurred or they've agreed with us, so we don't have any final appropriations, but the method that's used on the physical note doesn't look for that. It just looks what's left the House. May I ask another question? Yes, ma'am. I want to ask you about income inequality, right? Thinking about what people and families would get with an income tax reduction. Everybody gets something back. Some people get a whole lot more back. So there's, there's, there's again, an absolute value for everybody, but not in relative value. So the people at the, at the bottom end of our economic spectrum are not better off, they're worse off, in my mind, because the gap is wider. Um, if we go down to zero, I think some people are going to get $2 a week from that cut, and some people are going to get $1,000 a week. So how are the people who are going to get $2 a week not relatively worse off? Um, two things. You can, we have to be careful when we look at it and careful in conversations about whether we're using absolute dollars or using relative proportions. So if everyone is getting taxed 5% and everyone is then taxed 4%, then everyone's got an equal reduction in percentages. If you're looking for absolute dollar effect of those reduction of equal percentages, then of course you're going to have different outcomes because you have different outcomes, you have different inputs. Some people put in five million, some people put in five dollars, some people put in none. And as far as what about the lowest income earners or lowest income? Lowest income that have taxable income, you can look at different reports. We've got three or four from the economists and LRC, so I'm going to just give an approximate for conversation today. If you have about $20,000 or $22,000 of income in Kentucky, you're already not paying anything. And if you look closely, they may actually be getting a refund at that level and a little higher. So they're already at zero, where the rest of us are not. And if they're getting a refund, then they're at a better spot than any of us are, because they're not paying in and then getting a refund over the top of it. When you take together that context along with all of the social supports for lower income and you look at all the programs in the nonprofit area for those lower income, uh, there's a lot of support structures already there. Secondly, I'd also point to this, as I indicated in the presentation, uh, we're not taxing groceries, we're not taxing medical, and we're not taxing uh, your home utilities. Uh, those home utilities are going to be worth more to a lower income than a higher income because they have the disposable income to meet whatever is there. 
The same thing on groceries, those essentials, those are going to be more valuable to someone with a lower income than a higher income. I can't pull the numbers off the top of my head, but if you take those two, those three big expenditures where we don't collect the tax, we give a subsidy out basically, uh, those are tremendously maybe $2 billion. We're up in there very high. And that's money we're continually pushing out to lower income to assist. So if you disregard all of that, and then you just focus on this bill on personal income tax, then yeah, you go, wait a minute. Uh, somebody's getting too much money in absolute, even though we have equal percentages. Hopefully that helps understand where I'm coming from. I don't see the inequality there as long as we stick together with apples, apples, oranges, oranges, and we take a broader context look than just the bill itself. May I ask one more question? One more. Uh, we do have to be careful how we talk about it because people yes. earning $20,000 are not better off in any regard. So my final question is about something called the Kansas Experiment. Sure. It's on Wikipedia under Kansas Experiment. Yep. And this was 2012 when uh, the governor and the legislature in Kansas cut their income tax and took some other measures. Mm -hmm. And it had such a mm -hmm. devastating impact on state yeah, revenue that they repealed it five years later. Mm -hmm. What's different here? Uh, good question. And people will talk about don't want to be Kansas. And we don't want to be Kansas either. We want to be Kentucky. We want to do it the right way for Kentuckians. Um, a big difference is in the way that they had the timing of their structures. So, for instance, if you have a downward trajectory in revenue uh, or giving a tax break, as a, before you actually start to increase your revenues, you get caught in a negative. And that's what happened in Kansas. They just simply did not see that coming. That's not what we have here. We have the money, we have the funding for five to four, which is basically reducing our revenues to meet our budgetary needs, our appropriation needs. We have that. From four to zero, we do not go out in front of our skis and reduce our revenues before they're there. So we're not counting on, wait a minute, we have to get a certain amount of money that comes later on. No, if the revenue trigger is not hit, we don't go down. So we're always after the fact of when revenues arrive rather than reducing before the revenues come. Kansas got it backwards. We're back on needs again. Subjective rather than objective. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have two questions. I will ask them one at a time, and I may make a few comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the original House Bill 8, there was a provision, I believe, that included advertising being added to the sales tax. We've heard a lot of discussion, you and I. And I believe, could you, could you verify what the sub says with regard to sales tax in addition to advertising type items? I, I appreciate that. I've received uh, questions about the advertising, about the advertising um, issue. Uh, and advertising is broad first. It could encompass anything from uh, television ads to uh, radio ads to newspaper ads to ads placed at a venue to ads placed on a, on a card in, a, in an event center, all kinds of things. Um, newspapers had said double taxation. Uh, it's not. What was proposed was already the tax that's on a subscription and a tax that would be upon the placing of advertisement. Well, the advertisement is a tax on the person placing the ad. The subscription is the person that is actually subscribing. There's no tax on the, on the newspaper in either one of those. We also heard from some broadcasters, I think, that talked about free speech, and we can't tax that. Um, we already tax uh, speech that's through a commercial venue. I think every one of our campaigns have to pay to get time to speak. Uh, we don't get free speech. You can't go to a television station or radio and go, hey, I need 15 minutes, put me on. I'm not going to pay you anything. So not a really good argument there. Uh, what was a good argument, I've sat down and talked with KPA. I think they would be fine with House Bill 8 as proposed with no committee sub. It's fair. Uh, as to radio and television, that's where we started getting into some difficulties unanticipated. Newspaper markets, especially local papers, are geographically bound for the most part. That's where their value and their readership comes from. When you go to airwaves and television waves that go across imaginary state lines without any difficulty, then you end up with competitive problems between states. So Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Evansville, Cape Girard, Nashville, Huntington, all of those might have an advantage over Kentucky business because of the way those uh, airwaves flow without, without interruption. 
broadcast, television, and radio start going, okay, we may have an issue there, and I don't want to get into a competitive disadvantage. I think it would be a matter of degrees, but I don't want to do that, okay? I don't want to have an, an oops. Newspaper would have been fine. When you start trying to redefine those things, and Jennifer Hayes does a great job with those definitions, you run into extraordinary difficulty. Okay, and at that point, we could not, I could not in good faith try to get to a definition that I would have a level of confidence in that I could talk to the members of this committee and to the members of the body as a whole and say, yes, we can do this without great difficulty. There will be some cleanup, but nothing more than that. I could not get there on an issue. So the committee sub removes advertising in its entirety. So newspapers, radio, broadcasting, any of those other issues that surround advertising, the category has been removed. Not surgical removal of pieces, but the category was removed. Thank you for the question, though. Mr. Chair, if I could add a follow-up question. This is actually for Representative Fleming. Yes, sir. Uh, we had in committee earlier this week the your led actually bill on tax amnesty. I forget the number right now. In the committee sub, is that language consistent with what we discussed in your uh, bill that was presented this week and one question was brought up there was some discussion about uh, if somebody abuses the system they go apply for tax amnesty at some point down the road they're delinquent again I just want to clarify was that issue addressed in the committee sub the uh, the, the information uh, basically I mean yes in terms of the information is, is in the committee sub and so forth I mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, if they fail to provide or file um, uh, returns uh, over a certain period of time after the program, then they've got to pay them full. They got to pay the penalties, cost of uh, collection, uh, interest, and so forth. So, so that that is in there. And, and if I if I may, uh, just to make for clarification, uh, what was discussed on Tuesday relative to his uh, single filed bill on on tax amnesty remains almost exactly as been put in, in the sub, except for the following. This is a difference. Uh, Representative Fleming had focused on making sure that we have an RFP process to have a third party come in and took great pain and detail to make sure that it was customer service oriented, not just go get the money, but make sure there were metrics about as, do they have experience, do they have the personnel, can they return the calls, can they work through these things rather than just collect the money. That remains in there, but in conversations with DOR, they have expressed some concern that, well, what if we don't get a successful RFP? What if no one applies or someone not worthy uh, enough to handle Kentuckians' business uh, is in the mix? So we've simply said, if you do not have a successful RFP, we put a backstop that said that DOR will conduct it themselves, yeah. but we also made sure that the timing that DOR would enact that, or if there was no successful RFP, made sure that we went past or gave them leeway to go past the next tax season so they would be able to absorb that in their existing bandwidth. With that exception, largely the bill that Representative Fleming discussed on Tuesday is in this sub. Mr. Chair, if I could just make some brief comments while I had the floor. Yes, sir. Uh, this is my eighth year in the General Assembly. Uh, over that time, I have seen many pieces of legislation filed dealing with this issue. Uh, of how do we tax our citizens. Uh, there are different philosophical viewpoints on the best approach to make. Uh, I have always personally believed that the, the more you tax productivity, the less productivity that you're going to receive. Uh, people, when, when tax is based on consumption, sales tax, people uh, can make choices about what's important to them to spend their hard-earned money on. Uh, we already have, several, as you mentioned, we have many tax expenditures to protect those key essential areas uh, like food, prescription medicine, our primary uh, residents. So th th those are already in place. And I appreciate your uh, approach to this. Uh, I, would, I would make one other point. We talked in the previous judicial budget and the legislative budget about the pay increases. Uh, if this goes into effect on January 1st, not only will our state employees all across the state, but our private sector employees are going to get a 1% pay increase. That is more dollars in their pocket that they can choose to spend and invest in our local communities. Our ultimate goal was we want to build our state, we want to make our state better for everyone. 
and, and we recognize that we have to have business, we have to have workforce. So the work of the General Assembly is not just about this bill or this bill, it's collectively how we can work together. We have a lot of workforce issues. Uh, I hope we continue to work on all of these issues, but uh, I do support the concept of, uh, of the reduction in the income tax, putting more money in those people who are out there working every day to invest in our, in our state. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, sir. Um, I, I thank you, Representative Tipton, for speaking on that. And I just want to make sure for clarification purposes, uh, everyone understands if you have taxable income in Kentucky, personal taxable income from whatever source, then this would result in a, a reduction of your rate from 5 to 4%. So you mentioned state employees, uh, judicial, um, all the issues that we've talked about. And in our House Bill 1 Committee Sub 1, we have tried to address social workers specifically with a different uh, structure. Uh, state employees, uh, KSP, we've dealt with several. Uh, pushing money out to the locals discretionary so they can deal with teachers and all their staff. We've tried to cover that broad based, but understand as to all of those, as to each one of them, any one of them that has taxable income with House Bill 8 is currently situated, committee sub, section 1, their rate will go from 5 to 4%, which is a one-point reduction and about a 20-point uh, overall, percentage-wise. Got to look at absolutes and percentages. So a 20% rate reduction, reduction in the rate, and then a one-point absolute from 5 to 4 and that goes across the board to anybody that has taxable income, including those that are interested in COLAs, those that are retirees, uh, so forth and so on, because that 1%, once it goes, it stays there forever. So it's an increase for everyone. It's a reduction of our revenues to meet our appropriation needs and make sure that those people get the money. Thank you. And I just, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, I just want to put things yes, in pers perspective, um, and that is, if you look at from a holistic point of view, from the budget to House Bill 8, I believe you're seeing a significant shift, as the chairman said, in what and where we're going and what we're doing. We, we got to figure out who we are and where we're going. And between those two items uh, puts us in a very strong position in going forward so we can increase our population and to help help those where they need to be helped. So that one that one or 100 basis points one percent however you want to classify it is it's a significant uh, it's a significant uh impact uh you know to the pop to the population and we're anticipating hopefully uh as things progress we'll get down to a, a zero income tax and, and that's going to be pretty strong in terms of recruiting uh as well as expanding uh, expanding businesses and bringing folks in into the state representative wilner Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for the discussion. Um, and you know, philosophical differences. I, it won't come as a surprise to you that I have a different philosophy about all this. And I just I want to acknowledge that I think you know what works better for states is if we have a graduated income tax where those who can afford to do more do more. That it's a rising tide that lifts all boats where we can invest in public schools and public universities and um, you know pay our our public employees what they deserve and all of that good stuff mental health services so but you know I acknowledge I live in the land of reality and that's not the direction we're going and I, I do understand that um, so as I, I just want to make sure that I understand some things here and um, so when we lower the income tax rate um, one percent we're gonna lose about a billion dollars in revenue that we're gonna make up in these new taxes. Uh, is that roughly correct? Close. Um, okay. I, again, I would, I would differentiate between the, f the percentage drop from 5% to 4% and then 4% to zero. Okay, so yes, on current numbers, you can look at it and go a point drop from five to four, four to three, looking at roughly a little more than a billion dollars every time that happens on current numbers. But as far as um, understand that the five to four is a forced drop and the rest of them are on triggers. So whether or not they, they're, those triggers are not dependent upon us expanding the base and gathering more revenues in, 
uh, the expectation on projections, estimates now, is that revenues will continue to increase, and we're just taking a modest increase. And if you do that over about an eight to 10 year period, most years you would hit a trigger so that we could continue to drop. If those revenues stagnate, and if you had no base expansion whatsoever, as long as revenues hit the trigger, then the rate still drops. So the dependency is not necessarily there. The expansion of the base assists in more revenue, but the expansion of the base is not the method by which we get to the revenue increases. They do occur organically. They do occur for other reasons. They also occur for if you are in a better economic climate beyond our control, or a better economic climate in that people want to come to Kentucky more and produce more because they're having to be taxed less, then that's another part of the organic, organic growth that gets us to those triggers. From five to four, it's not dependent upon an expansion of the base at all. There is no correlation, there is no causation. It is simply from House Bill 1 to House Bill 8 gets us the five to four reduction. A quick follow up. Yes, ma'am. So the additional the additional sales tax that we're looking at, and thank you for that explanation. The additional sales tax that we're looking at, I don't see anything on there that horrifies me, right? I understand. But are we going to get? You know, you're not taxing groceries, you're not taxing medicines, all of that. Are we going to get pushback from industries who are being taxed more? And do we have the, are we going to be able to withstand pressure that we're going to get from groups that say, well, don't tax us more? Sure. Um, I don't know. Um, and, and the thing about it is, is that uh, I know Senator McDaniel has pointed this out multiple times. He keeps on his desk uh, a booklet from about 100 years ago where people were saying, what's wrong with the tax code? And it needs to be changed. And it's been going, going ever since. Politically, I mean, I can look at everybody in this room and everybody in this committee. You know, there are two things I can say in any room and everyone tightens up and then thinks I need to get out. Generally, I can say sex in a courtroom and everybody goes, juries and everybody else start looking around. Or you can say tax and everybody does the same thing and sometimes worse. What we have to do, and this is much like the judicial redistricting or reapportionment that we've talked about in judiciary recently, I, I, I ask that members put aside what's happening to me, what's happening to my, and think about the Commonwealth as a whole. We can have philosophical differences about to how to get there, but if we elevate the consideration of how do we make Kentucky healthier economically, and how does it lift everyone? How do we avoid hurting anyone in particular unfairly and trying to lift and look at a better method? We'll turn out fine. We may disagree on the how, but we've got the same direction, and I hope we have enough members that go, this is the right thing to do. It's not going to make everyone happy. There's no way you could say the word tax and make everybody happy. There will be plenty of people in this room and outside of this room that go, any dollar that we reduce is going to end up in the end of the Commonwealth. I don't believe that. I don't believe that in fact because we just came out with House Bill 1, House Committee Sub 1, that budgeted to needs, and some people say a little more than needs, and we can argue about that, and we had money left over that was collected that we didn't appropriate. Now, the government is good at spending money. The government is usually very poor about disciplining itself to make sure it's not spending other people's money too fast and unnecessarily. So if everyone has the willpower to do that, or enough have the willpower to do that, to restrain the appetites, discipline, and look for the needs, and that's a matter of degree, um, yes, and this is a good structure to further that mindset and make Kentucky a healthier place economically for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Gentry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to try to ask a couple of real basic, simple questions. <laughs> okay, um, first of all, I think, you, I think you already answered my first question, which uh, the reduction in income tax rate of about 1% is equates to about $1 billion in current dollars. Is that correct? 
a little over a billion. Um, and the tax revenues that we are adding, the taxes that we are adding, what do we project that to be as of right now? So the expansion of the base, and I want to make sure I'm clear because whenever you talk about sales tax, you can talk about raising the rate. We are not doing that. So the rate is not changing. No, I understand that. No, I'm yeah. just making sure that I'm clear okay. with everybody. I know you do. I'm just making sure that I'm not, I'm not uh, being clear enough for everybody else. So we're not at that, but on the sales base expansion, okay, first comb, first estimate back on what was in House Bill 8 was around in a full year would be approximately $160 million. Now, the committee sub eliminates some. We don't have another estimate of that so 160 was on the top end i hesitate to give you a guess on the final comb through okay so follow up question so we're looking at uh we've got to come up with another close to a billion dollars or whatever to to make this a revenue ne neutral move where where's that coming from okay. again i'm going to go back to um, I have to be careful about the question and the answer, okay? From five to four, it's dealt with through the budgeting process. It's already handled. From four to zero, we don't have to, by expansion of the base, come up with anything because the rate does not reduce and our collection on that tax does not reduce until our revenues have reached a trigger that's safe enough for us to reduce our rate. Okay. Okay. So using the surplus funds to put us in that position of four percent. Not and use it. Not using a surplus fund. I just want to make sure I'm clear. Okay. Uh, we're not affecting. We're not proposing any changes to the reserve trust fund. So some people would consider that a reference to that. No. Okay. This is based on increased revenues, organically or with the assistance of an expansion of the base to get us to a trigger that would re result in a reduction of the rate either by a half point or a full point. Okay, so I, I think I get it now. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I was around when you guys came in. We, we all came in together, as you know, and um, I remember 2018. That was the first step. That was the hardest step. It was. If, if you want to go to consumptive-based tax, which you guys want to do, um, we had a progressive tax, tax system. We went to a flat-rate tax system. The only way you can do that on that first step is, is to cut taxes for – for the higher income people and 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 raise that rate to for the the lowest and and the smallest of small businesses and and um so so that's tough and and now as we continue moving forward to to me this is just a a continued shift of the tax burden where if you if you look at how much is paid relative to how much income somebody's having because of sales tax let, let's face it it's a flat tax and we're getting rid of a progressive tax system. So we are we are shifting from a total pro progressive system, or not total progressive, a, a part progressive flat tax system to a total flat tax system with consumptive base. And I just want to make sure that's clear to everybody. If I, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, somewhat. Uh, remember in 2018, with the tax that existed prior to that, uh, we can all reference it as progressive. It really wasn't. It had about two steps in it, and the first step was at a very low level. Uh, so really, it was an effective flat tax, but not that. There was a slight difference somewhere. Uh, it was truly flattened in, in, in 18 to be that, but the rate reduced on, on uh, personal tax income rate reduced, and the sales tax rate did not increase. It was an expansion of the base then. The time... The context then is entirely different than it is now. Um, they were not able to budget at that time for various reasons, any kind of unappropriated funds. So the only way that you could look is at an 18 viewpoint of, ooh, we're gonna lose some money on revenue by reducing the rate, but we've gotta make it up or make up a good portion of it somewhere else. That's not the mindset that's in House Bill 8. The context, the time is entirely different and the structure is entirely different. Okay. I, I just want to thank you for taking the time to explain all this. So yeah, I appreciate happy it. To, happy to have the opportunity to. All right. At this time, we have uh, four individuals that have signed up to speak on this matter. 
I just want to make the room aware that I'm, I'm shooting for a hard six o'clock vote if we can. Um, if we can just uh, so for those four individuals, if we can keep it around five minutes, there's some give and take there, obviously. But if we can just kind of keep it around five minutes, I would be grateful. Um, first up is Jenny from 120 AFT. Sorry, sorry, I'm trying to get out of the way. She's very tiny. She fits in close spaces. Thank you so much. That's perfect. Thank you. You can take your mask off. You want to take the mask off? Okay. <laughs> Jenny, if you could just uh, introduce yourself for the record, and then I'll swear you in, okay? Hi, I'm Jenny Bowlander um, from Lexington, Kentucky. Raise your right hand. Do you, sorry. Uh, Jenny, <laughs> do you swear to uh, firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. You may proceed. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jenny Ward Bolander, and I'm a teacher at Henry Clay High School and an adjunct professor at Georgetown College. I'm here today representing Kentucky 120 United AFT, and I want to start by thanking you all for allowing me to speak to you today on behalf of my union to express our thoughts on House Bill 8. Um, Kentucky 120 United AFT members had many questions when we began looking at House Bill 8, but our first major question was how are we going to replace the 40% of the state's budget that we lost by cutting income tax? This becomes especially concerning when you realize that 41.7% of the state's budget is currently allocated to K-12 education. And while we recognize that the cuts to the state income are incremental, the resulting increases in taxes on goods and services meant to replace them at a glance didn't appear to be able to make up that shortfall. So I worry a lot about what will happen if this bill passes. My daughter, who's here, will be in kindergarten this upcoming year. For the next 13 years, I will be the parent of a student in the Fayette County Public School System. If this bill were to pass, I worry that she will lose educational opportunities because the resources may not be available. I worry about college affordability as the tuition costs have skyrocketed while the contributions to our state universities have dwindled to practically nothing. In 1999, when I was enrolled as a freshman at UK, my tuition was $1,648 a semester. Today, a freshman will pay $12,484 a semester for that same education. I shudder to think what that price tag will look like when my daughter enrolls in 2035, especially with the directions we are taking, as the limited money allocated to our public universities will likely run completely dry with these cuts to income taxes. House Bill 8 looks to be entirely too close to the Kansas experiment um, for my comfort with the tax cuts that they bragged would boost their economy and put more money in people's pockets. Unfortunately, the opposite ended up being true. They too believed it would stimulate economic growth in their state and were proven horribly wrong. Florida and Tennessee have also made similar tax changes like Kansas did, but the loss in state revenue was replaced by a thriving and robust tourist industry that simply just doesn't exist here in that same volume, making us much more in line to have the exact same results as Kansas. Kentucky 120 United AFT respectfully asks that you vote no on House Bill 8 and we encourage the members of this esteemed body to work together to find changes that will work towards and for the common good of the people of the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Petrie, would you like to respond or? Not at this time. Okay. At this time, uh, Angela from KFTC. How you doing? Please have a seat there at the table. Please introduce yourself for the record. Hello, my name is Angela Rao and I am from Brown County. I am a KFTC economic, I'm sorry, I'll take this off. I am a Round County KFTC chapter member. I also serve on the Economic Justice Committee of KFTC and some of my things I will say as a KFTC member and then some as a citizen. Um, KFTC, we have been studying this okay, bill. Okay, hang on just a second. Oh, Please raise your right hand. Oh, I'm sorry. You swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Oh, you may proceed. Uh, we have been studying this bill, and it is very theoretical. And Representative Petrie, yes, uh, you know, made a good argument, and it's, you know, it sounds all good, but there are, you know, very real concerns on that, one of which is the higher education. Um, I work in higher education, so obviously funding being cut to higher education is an issue. We already have cut services and personnel and staff at the university, so any reduction in funding is only going to increase the more of us losing our positions and not being able to get salary wages and such. Um, 
it's just it's all very theoretical so it's hard to say like we can't we don't know like you said you don't have the fiscal note because you so you don't know exactly what is going to happen because this no income tax has been in kentucky the way it is but there are other states like tennessee and kansas and other places that have had the no income taxes and those are all very negative and they're very regressive that end up with people on the lower income paying more and speaking of the bevin taxes i currently am also under the poverty level i make thirty three thousand dollars a year which is the most that i've made in my entire life but um sorry this is my first time speaking so i'm a bit <laughs> like nervous here um so i went from getting kentucky tax returns when the flat rate when the flat tax came into effect, I went from getting returns to paying in taxes, and my taxes that I have paid in have went up every year, even though my income has basically stayed the same. So, and theoretically he says, you know, like, oh, we're all gonna get this money back and everybody will have money in their pocket. Well, you know, $104 to me with $33,000 a year is not the same as $100 or $1,000 to someone making, you know, $100,000 a year. And then also another thing that needs to be taken into account, the I agree that graduated taxes would be the best thing to rise us to bring the boat up and all of us have better chances and better opportunities. Because before it was technically sort of progressive, but not perfect, but at least before. So for instance, in 2016, I took my state tax return and my federal tax return and started a individual development account with the Kentucky Domestic Violence Association and bought my vehicle with it. My first like new to me vehicle. And then before that, I've been divorced since 2005 and I always took my taxes and I paid up my rent and utilities and everything that I could. So not all of us go waste our taxes and buy, you know, everything. And theoretically, yes, we would have money to, you know, consumption taxes or you have the choice to what you spend your money on. That is not true if you live in poverty because there are many of us who can't afford to buy groceries, can't afford to pay rent. So it's just not true, that is, a, is a, a, not a correct picture of that people can just make choices on what to, they want to spend their money on. If you have income, yes. If you have disposable income, yes. But if you don't, then, then you don't have that choice. So my point is, is that we should have a more progressive tax rate instead of making it worrying about businesses and things if we really want Kentucky to get better and we want to bring people up and be able to climb out. You see that um, meme of the person in poverty and they're trying really hard to, to pull themselves up. That's what we are doing. That's what people in Eastern Kentucky are truly trying to do. So it would be very helpful if you guys would work with us and help us do that. And having that progressive tax would be go much further to help us than, than that, than this proposed bill. I'm sorry, and I apologize. Okay, I think that's all I have to say. Okay, am I? Free to go now. <laughs>
for our children to thrive, to be healthy, and contribute to our communities. It's through the income tax that families do together what they cannot afford to do alone. As a representative of the Kentucky Faith Communities, I urge you to consider very carefully the impact of giving away the critical source of our shared prosperity in the form of income tax cuts to the wealthiest Kentuckys, Kentuckians. Dissipating Kentucky's income tax will decimate these services. That will hurt us all now, and it will hurt our state's economy as Kentuckians struggle even more to get a good education and stay healthy. Even if we didn't eliminate the income tax, even if we just cut the income tax rate from 5% to 4%, it would cost the state over a billion dollars. That's more than we spend on our community colleges and state universities. Indeed, income tax cuts will hurt us all, but they will especially hurt school children in low-income districts, families in rural counties, Kentuckians of color, people with disabilities, seniors, and other Kentuckians who, because of barriers they face, cannot afford to make up for state funding losses. This plan doesn't even come close to paying for income tax cuts in order to protect funding for our schools, mental health care, and other critical services. Based on what happened when Kentucky cut income tax in 2018, if you might, as, as it's been heard, legislature flattened the income tax to 5% and to pay for it, expanded the sales tax base to include many services that low and middle income families use. And based upon other states that cut income tax, we know that the regressive sales tax increases will be coming. May not happen today, may not happen this year, but they will be coming. Low income families, and in these days, even many of us who consider ourselves middle class, spend a large share of all of every paycheck to make ends meet. That means a much larger share of their income is subject to the sales tax than the income of wealthier Kentuckians. When you swap income for sales tax, you are swapping many Kentuckians' ability to make ends meet for an extra cushion for the wealthy few. Cutting income tax delivers huge rewards to those who already have more than they need. According to the Institution on Taxation and Economic Policy, millionaires would get more than 11,000 annually from a cut in Kentucky's income tax rate to 4% and more than 55,000 annually from an elimination of Kentucky income tax. On behalf of the faith communities of, across the Commonwealth, I urge you not to give away Kentucky's future and our very well-being today to line the pockets of the wealthy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Jason from Kentucky Policy. Please introduce yourself for the record. Jason Bailey, I'm the Executive Director of the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy. Please raise your hand. Yes. You swear for, t uh, firm, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. I do. You may proceed. Thank you, Chairman Reed and Chairman Petrie and members of the committee. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today um, on House Bill 8. You know, Kentucky has a, a large revenue surplus currently, but I think as everyone has recognized, that is temporary and is, a, is the result of federal aid. What's beyond that for our budget is very uncertain. But lawmakers are constitutionally required to pass a balanced budget. Uh, however, HB 8 will ensure budgets are grossly imbalanced in the near future and become more imbalanced over time, leading inevitably to massive budget cuts, a failure to meet obligations like pensions, and or huge tax increases on middle and low income Kentuckians. You know, the income tax, the individual income tax, brings in 40% of our revenue. It's equal to about the same share that we spend on our entire K-12 public school system. 
So just a one point one point cut, as has already been mentioned, is over a billion dollars, about what we spend on eight universities and 16 community colleges. I haven't seen the fiscal note, but we just heard information shared that uh, $160 million would be raised from the services. However, in the committee substitute, advertising, which is the largest service in the original bill, has been taken out. So we're looking at a, a set of services that raise about 10% of what is lost from a one-point cut, the initial one-point cut in the income tax. So we will lose one point, uh, basically $1.2 billion and only gain about 10% of that back. That's, even, that's just initially. The triggers in the bill to lower the income tax in the future uh, are sure to be surpassed uh, simply because of price inflation. And we, we are living in an environment of price inflation. We know that just because you have more money doesn't mean you can buy more stuff. That's true with government as well. And just to give an example of that, uh, state tax revenues 20 years ago were half of what they were today. We have not doubled the size of state government in the last 20 years. In fact, we have 6,800 fewer state employees today than we had 20 years ago, but double the revenue. That's how inflation works. This bill sets triggers based on nominal dollar amounts in the future that will be surpassed that will trigger automatic cuts that the, bu the bill does not replace. So the legislation automatically digs a deeper and deeper hole over time and provides no answer as to how we will fill it. So the cost for this biennium uh, is basically a billion, a billion and a half, because it takes effect halfway through the first year of the, of the fiscal year. We know that there are extra revenues uh, because of this one-time stimulus, uh, and that will cover that now. But those revenues won't be there to cover the gap the next budget when the hole gets bigger. Uh, it will be, uh, based on a preliminary estimate, uh, a little over $2 billion in the next biennium. We're talking about the gap. Uh, the biennium after that will be over $3 billion. In 10 years, uh, it will be 5 to $6 billion because the, the triggers will continue to be hit. And we'll just get bigger over time until we lose the income tax, which is 40% of our revenue. So that just leaves a big magic asterisk about in HB8 that is just not paid for. And you, um, the simple truth is you can't get something for nothing. Uh, the bill will have to come due. And when the other shoe drops, we'll be forced to slash the budget. Kentuckians will pay for that through the economic and community loss of fewer teachers, fewer social workers, in the degradation of our public schools, for which the little bit of money people will get in an income tax cut will come nowhere near enough for them to pay for private school alternatives and much higher university and community college tuition in future health crises we will lack the capacity to address and much more we'll have difficulty continuing to pay down our pension obligations and meeting our other financial obligations as a state and it will also force tax increases the only tax that's anywhere close to replacing what we would lose from the income tax would be the sales tax which hits middle and low-income people the most House, House Bill 8 disproportionately uh, takes billions of dollars out of the budget and disproportionately gives it to the wealthy. 65% of the dollars will go to the top 20% of people. 37% of the dollars will go to the top 5% of people. And the big winners are the people at the very top. The top 1% will receive an average tax cut of $11,000 in the first year from this one-point cut. And with the complete elimination of the income tax, they will receive a $55,000 cut on average every year. In contrast, uh, the typical Kentucky family will get about $278 from this initial cut. That's $5 a week. Workers under the poverty line and all, pretty much all, most all seniors uh, won't get anything. Um, so uh, a large share of Kentuckians will not receive a tax cut, but those are the people who are hardest hit by an eventual uh, tax increase, budget cuts uh, and tax increases, and these are folks who do pay taxes. They pay sales taxes, they pay property taxes, and so forth. Uh, we need to approach with, with um, uh, claims about economic benefits from cuts like this with an extreme caution. So let's talk first about- Jason, if yeah. I may, we're already past the five minute mark. Okay. If we can just kind of wrap yeah. it up. Sure. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Um, 
Other states have tried this experiment. We've talked about Kansas, but it's not just Kansas. Around the same time, Arizona, North Carolina, Ohio, Maine, and Wisconsin also passed income tax cuts. They all saw substantial budget cuts as a result. They all had economic growth that was slower than the national average in the period after the cuts take take effect. So it's it's a dangerous um, path to go down to assume that we will be able to fill the gap with population growth and economic activity. I will stop there and just say that the bill from HB8 uh, won't, won't come in this session because we have extra monies, but it will come. And it will mean larger class sizes, a sicker population, lower educational attainment, a hampered court system, uh, increased pension liabilities, shuttered state parks, and other fallout or higher taxes on the people who can pay them least. This is the most consequential bill affecting our budget in nearly 100 years. It doesn't just give away the current surplus, but creates a fiscal crisis that will grow over time. And so I urge you to slow down with this bill and carefully consider and collect all the facts and consider what harms will come from this legislation. So thank you. Appreciate motion the Motion on the bill. Thank you, sir. We have a motion on House Bill 8 as amended by committee sub number 3. Representative Petrie, would you like to conclude before we take a roll call vote? Briefly, if I may, um, one, I appreciate the questions from members. I appreciate the uh, presentations from members in the, in the audience. Um, it's actually very helpful to me and I hope helpful to others. Um, the comments I've heard, I think, still uh, stem from an, an understanding of House Bill 8 and its structure that's fundamentally um, mistaken. Um, also from that, House Bill 1 to House Bill 8, it's interesting that um, it was a historic budget and how much money went into K through 12, how much money went into higher ed, how much money went into Medicaid, how much money went into pensions, how much money went into raises, how much money went into SCL waivers, how much money went into staff for those waivers, and on and on and on. I think we've made it clear to this body, at least in the House, that those things are priorities, that we watch out for those things and that they're valuable. House Bill 1 uh, states those priorities. House Bill 8 lets us get to those priorities even better in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Clerk, please call the roll. Representative Beckler. Yes, ma'am. Representative Bentley. Yes, ma'am. Representative Blanton. Aye. Representative Bridges. Yes. Representative Dossett. Yes. Representative Fisher. Yes. Representative Fleming. Aye. Representative Flood. No. Representative Fugit. Yes. Representative Gentry. No. Representative Hale. Yes. Representative Hart. Yes. Representative Hatton. No. Representative McCool. Yes. Representative Nemus. Yes. Representative Plumbo. No. Representative Prunty. Yes. Representative Raymond. No. Representative Reed. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Santoro. Yes. Representative Tipton. Yes. Representative Wilner. No. Representative Petrie. Yes. With 18 yes votes, six no votes, zero passes, HB 8, as amended by committee sub number three, passes favorably, same show on the House floor. The chair will now entertain a motion, motion. for the title amendment. Motion. There's a, there's a motion and a second on the title amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. Title amendment passes. Thank you, Representative Petrie. We appreciate your time and effort on this on these bills. At this time, seeing no further business before the committee, the committee is adjourned.